Have you ever heard about the man named Abdul Fakadi, the self-professed supreme military commander, president for life, and king of kings of the Socialist Democratic Federated Republic of Carbombia? Population 4,000 people and 10,000 camels. Well, he is best known for spelling the ultimate end for two original and fairly popular Autobot characters. Blue Streak and Cliff Jumper were practically retired when their voice actor, the iconic Casey Kasem, who was of Lebanese heritage, was deeply offended by Fakadi's negative stereotype and quit the show. Back in the 80s, when the world was, for lack of a better word, less educated, for better or for worse, it was almost second nature for different nationalities to be generalized into stereotypes. And even if we weren't quite aware of it ourselves, as kids growing up back then, we were exposed to a lot of these stereotypes in the toys and especially shows that we watched. Yes, there were other villains of the week like Abdul Fakadi, but fortunately, it wasn't all negative. From the very start, G.I. Joe, a real American hero, set out to give kids one of the most diverse cast of characters, at least for its time. While the very first team of Joes was predominantly white, also present was the African-American Soccer and the Hispanic Zap. The next year featured another African-American in Doc and the first Native American, Airborne. Although all four of these characters were introduced to little or no attention given to their respective races. Simply put, as kids, most of us just didn't care. We didn't notice because all we saw were a cool looking ranger, a bazooka soldier, a medic, and a helicopter assault trooper. All four real American heroes, regardless of their skin color or race. Which was what made those early years of G.I. Joe special and ahead of its time in my opinion. With G.I. Joe being quite a success, by the third year, Hasbro was working with a bigger budget and I guess wanted to add even more variety and color into their toy line. And so we got another Native American Joe, Charlie Iron Knife, codenamed Spirit. But unlike Airborne the year before, there was no mistaking Spirit's ethnic heritage as he embraced the popular Native American stereotypes of the time completely. Spirit sported an almost civilian-looking uniform complete with tassel trimmings on the sides of his pants and fur-top moccasin boots. Spirit also sported two long hair braids, headband, and a necklace of fangs and feathers around his neck. Instead of a normal standard-issue weapon, he came with something that could only be best described as a dart rifle. Oh, and he also came with a pet bald eagle named Freedom. And finally, instead of having a traditional specialty or designation such as infantry, ranger, or marine, Spirit was a tracker because we all know that all Native Americans are more in touch with nature and the earth. In the cartoons, Spirit also got the honor of being G.I. Joe's counter to Cobra's brand new spanking ninja Storm Shadow. Yup, for some reason in the cartoons, Snake Eyes wasn't much into the whole ninja thing. So when looking for a Joe who could match up well with a Cobra Ninja, Spirit was called up to be the Joe's version of a mystic badass. And he pretty much managed to hold his own. And while both warriors fought to a draw trapped inside an underwater cave in the island of no return, it was Spirit who formulated a way for both of them to ultimately escape. Anyway, did you guys ever watch this 2009 show called The Deadliest Warrior? Well, it was this cool series wherein a bunch of weapon experts and simulation geeks would theorize on who would win battles between different warriors across history, like a Japanese samurai versus a Norse Viking, or a Shaolin monk versus a Maori warrior. The premise was pretty cool, execution bordering on cheesy, but overall highly entertaining. Well, Spirit vs. Storm Shadow was sort of the Joe's child-friendly version of that show. The Native American Warrior vs. the Japanese Ninja. But back to Spirit. I thought it would be also worth mentioning that in the cartoon, Spirit was voiced by Greg Berger, better known as the voice of the Dinobot Grimlock. What? A white guy doing a Native American Indian voice? For shame! <laughs> Just kidding. It was the 80s. No one really cared or raised a fuss over a silly non-issue like that. And I thought he did a fairly adequate job. I mean, it could have been worse. Me, spirit, kick butt! To be honest though, aside from that one memorable encounter with Storm Shadow, I don't really remember Spirit being featured much. And in the Marvel comics, he was also used sparingly, usually when a mission involved finding someone. And speaking of his specialty, that of being a tracker, a really nice short story was written in 2010 as part of the G.I. Joe anthology, Hearts and Minds, that tells us more about Spirit's talent. 
In the story, he states that he truly is more in touch with nature, but not because he's Injun as some ignorant people would assume. Instead, he reveals that he has a condition diagnosed when he was younger called sensory integration dysfunction. I guess you can Google exactly what this condition is, but in his own words, he explains that while most people only notice certain things, specific sights, sounds, or smells, he notices everything, to the point that as a child, he suffered from extreme sensory overload. To deal with this, he would isolate himself, spending time away from busy and populated places, which often meant being out in the wilderness, where over the years, he learned to hone his ability, control it, and use it to his advantage. This ability to notice more subtle things in his surroundings that most people would miss out on is what makes him an excellent tracker. Anyway, as a kid, it didn't really bother me at all that Spirit looked like he stepped right out of an old Western movie. All that mattered was that he stood out. It made him look cooler to me because he was unique. Granted, I'm Asian, so what do I know? But speaking of which, after the introduction of Spirit, it turned out that I didn't have to wait too long before Hasbro took a swing, or better yet, a kick, at their very first attempt at an Asian G.I. Joe. The following year in 1985, one new Joe in particular really stood out. Well, his card art was pretty tough to ignore considering he had his bare foot aimed right at your face. Despite getting an almost offensively stereotypical American Indian character the year before, for me, Quick Kick was the first Joe that really stood out to me as different. Maybe it was because his uniform basically consisted of long black pants, a red sash, and a headband. Or maybe it was his unconventional specialty, silent weapons. Or it could have been the fact that he was the first obviously Asian character introduced to the Joe ranks. Whatever it was, Quick Kick was definitely proof that Hasbro was now way out of the box for this army-based toy line. I guess Quick Kick's look and specialty wasn't much of a surprise given that at the time of his release, almost every Asian character created had to be a martial arts expert. But to their credit, when it came to his personality, at least in the cartoon, Quick Kick kind of bucked the trend of being a wise and reserved Asian who would speak in deep and thoughtful proverbs and riddles. That's what Spirit would do. Instead, Quick Kick was an in-your-face and cheerful personality who had an endearing or maybe to others annoying habit of including bad Hollywood celebrity impressions in his daily speak. See, before joining G.I. Joe, Quick Kick was a Hollywood stuntman and according to his debut in the cartoon was shooting a frozen fudgy bar commercial in some cold place. Okay, sorry, I forget where exactly, but it involved snow, ice, and leopard seals when he runs into a couple of Joes in trouble and rescues them. It's quite a memorable debut since one, on his first outing, he defeats a couple of leopard seals, a bunch of crimson guards, and finally Cobra's resident fearsome ninja, Storm Shadow, on his own. And two, he does all of this without wearing any shirt and shoes in the snow. Quick Kick was also voiced by Cambodian-American actor Francois Chao who is best known for his role as the mysterious Dr. Pierre Chang in one of my most favorite TV shows of all time, Lost. Yes, I know this reference is quite old, but as a huge fan of Lost, this still is a cool bit of trivia for me. So, there. Anyway, aside from Quick Kick's rather memorable introduction, the story behind his real name is also quite interesting. As per his file card, Quick Kick's real name is MacArthur S. Ito, which was made by combining the names of World War II military leaders General Douglas MacArthur of the United States and Lieutenant General Takeo Ito of Japan. Oh, and another interesting tidbit is that in the British comic book continuity, before becoming a Hollywood stuntman, Quick Kick actually trained under Shang-Chi, the master of Kung Fu. Now while Quick Kick continued to be a regular in the cartoon along with his fellow 1985 wave mate buddies, Alpine and Bazooka, the silent weapons master had a rougher time in the more realistic Marvel comics. First of all, he was involved in a very memorable story arc wherein he and fellow Joe's stalker and snow job spent months as prisoners in a Barovian gulag. I remember this being quite a distressing read as a kid since their imprisonment seemed to have lasted forever and it wasn't easy seeing some of my favorite Joes in such a desperate and sorry state. And I specifically remember Quick Kick being the most banged up and injured of the trio. Fortunately, they all make it out alive as they were eventually rescued by an unsanctioned Joe operation. Unfortunately, it would be only a matter of time before Quick Kick's luck would eventually run out. 
Issues later, in another ill-fated mission in the Middle Eastern nation of Trushal Abysmia, a G.I. Joe convoy of which Quick Kick is part of is captured by Cobra, and unfortunately this time around, he isn't as lucky. In a historical move by Marvel to try and make the comic more realistic, Quick Kick and a bunch of other Joes are actually killed off when a tank that they hijacked to escape is blown up. So, rest in peace, Quick Kick. Wow. Okay, so that series of unfortunate events must have been quite a blow to your spirit, huh? Well, how about a quick kick back into form from me as I ask you to help me out once again by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. It's a small gesture from you, but a huge help for me and would be much appreciated. And if you already have, then, well, thank you. Have a frozen fudgy bar on me. Anyway, of the two, I only had the original quick kick figure in my collection. At the time of Spirit's release the year prior, I was still kind of dependent on my parents for Joe, so I didn't really have a choice on who I got. I would have loved to get him though if I had the chance, even if the actual action figure had an oddly Caucasian toned skin and braids that whipped out each side making him look more like Pippi Longstocking. He came with his eagle freedom, which I thought looked cool. What can I say? I was a sucker for Joe's with animal sidekicks. On the other hand, Quick Kick came at a time when 1. I had a more substantial allowance and 2. I discovered a local store where I could spend said allowance on some Joes. And as such, when I got the opportunity, Quick Kick was one of the first Joes I got from his wave. And even if he didn't come with any firearms or shoes, I didn't care. His sword and nunchucks were all this guy needed. Years later, as part of the 25th anniversary of the toy line, both Spirit and Quick Kick were early recipients of modern updates. Quick Kick was a pretty decent figure which unfortunately wasn't available as a single card release. Instead, you needed to get a special DVD battles pack that came with other figures. But I think it was worth the extra expense. Spirit, on the other hand, was sold single carded, but unfortunately I feel that his update came out even worse than the original. Better articulation aside, this modern version had a pretty ugly and may I say more racially offensive head sculpt with his sad droopy eyes, thick eyebrows, and big nose. I don't know, I feel like the sculptor was trying to make him too Indian. I myself actually did my own spirit custom based on his look from the excellent 2009 micro series G.I. Joe Resolute where spirit did nothing but literally stand around. It wasn't quite a departure from his vintage look, but it had a few subtle detail changes from his original design that I felt was worth the effort to customize. At the very least, they ditched the braids. But if you want to talk about departures, I give you Spirit and Quick Kick from 2010's Pursuit of Cobra line. Now these were real modernized versions and not just direct updates to the vintage figures that the 25th anniversary ones were. And as an added bonus of sorts, both Spirit and Quick Kick's designs seem to be sneaky homages to a couple characters from other popular franchises of the 80s. First up is Spirit, who pretty much ditched all the stereotypical Native American trimmings, including Freedom, in exchange for a more real-world getup. It was a total reinvention of the character that thankfully included a much better head sculpt. What was interesting about this version though was that it looked kinda like the mercenary soldier Billy Soul from the movie Predator, who was played by the late Sonny Landham. Well, to my knowledge, Hasbro has never confirmed if this likeness was intentional. The plot does thicken when you look at reimagined versions of fellow Joes Ricondo and Duke, who were released at the same time bearing similarities to other Predator characters, Blaine Cooper and Dutch Schaefer, respectively. And of course, we also got a new Cobra character called Shadow Tracker, whose mysterious masked face and long dreads call to mind the Predator itself. As for Quick Kick, this time around he came equipped with more practical accessories and equipment, like a vest which was removable, and shoes, so he no longer had to walk around barefoot in the snow. While the original figure's accessories, the sword and nunchucks were included, he now also came with some cool sparring gloves and a gun. With a silencer, of course. I mean, the guy's still Mr. Silent Weapons. And now I'm not sure if this was actually intentional as well, but to add to the coolness factor of this quick kick, his black uniform bears a close resemblance to the uniform worn by the infamous Cobra Kai Club, who are best known as the antagonists of Daniel in the Karate Kid movies. 
Yes, I know that this is even more of a stretch since this was well before the resurgence of the Karate Kid franchise in the form of the Cobra Kai series, but it's a fun speculation. And before we move on, I want to mention just one more spirit that Hasbro had up its sleeve as part of the 50th anniversary. To commemorate their iconic battle from the cartoon, Hasbro released a Storm Shadow and Spirit 2-pack. Now while I initially bought the 2-pack for Storm Shadow, which was an improved take on his original version 2 deco, Spirit ended up winning me over as the star of the set. While it's mostly a reuse of the Pursuit of Cobra Spirit, his return to a predominantly tan uniform with a light bluish gray scarf and red headband serves as a nice subtle callback to the original design without going over the top. And finally, we come full circle back to the original vintage designs for the most part, just done right in the larger 112 scale G.I. Joe classified line. Having already put together a huge 118th scale Joe collection over the years, I originally couldn't justify myself starting yet another collection of Joes, and I resisted successfully for three years, even after they unveiled an awesome looking spirit and quick kick. But on the fourth year, this year, I finally broke and gave in. And while he wasn't the reason for the death of my resolve, Spirit was one of the first classified figures that I got. Like I said, I'm a sucker for Joes with animal sidekicks. But all jokes aside, now this is how Spirit should have been done. This version has all the classic elements of the vintage toy without going too out of its way to perpetuate the Native American stereotype. Gone are the tassel-lined pants and fur top moccasin boots, and in their place are more standard military-issued gear. His odd dart gun thingy has also been replaced with a sniper rifle, perhaps hinting at a less stereotypical military specialty. So overall, it's a win. On the flip side, for some reason I wasn't as keen as getting myself a classified quick kick. I mean, for the longest time he was one of those, I'll get him another time, no rush. But I eventually did come around to getting Mr. Ito, and while I was expecting just the vintage figure but bigger, I was pleasantly surprised with how fun this classified quick kick turned out to be. With an extra sword and nunchuck for some dual wielding action, alternate hands, and more expressive secondary head, he's just great fun to fiddle around with and pose. Plus, frozen fudgy bar for the win. So yeah, at the end of the day, would I really go as far as to call out both Spirit and Quick Kick as lazy, offensive racial stereotypes? Nah. I mean, they were products of a more innocent time and I don't believe their creation was done with any malicious intent. In fact, I would go as far as to say that they were meant more to be seen as celebrations of the nationalities that they represented. Spirit was a courageous, noble, and wise warrior and Quick Kick was a highly skilled, deadly but highly entertaining operative. And as kids, and now adults, that's all that really should matter. Everything else are just superfluous details that can easily be rectified and corrected without having to resort to having to cancel the character. So it's all good in my book. But what do you think about this issue? Is it an issue? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want a story about how another company handled their supposedly racially offensive character, you can check it out over here. But if you just want more Joe stuff, check out this playlist over here. Either way, thanks for watching and hope you come back for more.